Hi, folks. Hope you're doing well. Anne here from Zevo Health. Thank you so much for joining me today on our webinar around the topic of vicarious trauma. Now, anybody that's working in the industry of trust and safety, anybody that's working as a content moderator or working with content moderators, the topic of vicarious trauma is one that's a really, really important one to uh, be aware of. First of all, it's something that uh, it's really important for us to have uh, an understanding of it and to recognize it as a potential impact of uh, engaging with graphic and disturbing content as part of your everyday role. So there will be various aspects of the theme of vicarious trauma that we will work through uh, it is something that is heavy in nature, the experience of it, the impact of it, but it is one that it's it's a reality that it can be a potential uh, impact of engaging in this kind of work. And given the unique nature of the role of a content moderator, uh, it is something that makes more sense for us to be fully aware of all the implications, fully aware of the potential negative outcomes and the potential negative impact of the kind of uh, work that a content moderator will be engaged with. And what we want to do by addressing uh, something like vicarious trauma, we want to safeguard. So we want to be uh, mindful. We want to be proactive. We want to be aware of the context of the lived experience of uh, somebody that's working in content moderation. So whether that is yourself who's in a role of content moderator, whether you are uh, managing a team of people that are engaged in uh, this kind of work, it's always going to be uh, very beneficial. It's always going to be very important for us to be informed, to be educated around topics such as this. So by way of uh, introduction, first things first, uh, Zevo Health, uh, we are committed to supporting you on your journey towards uh, improved health and well-being. It is important for us to say that the trainings that we provide, uh, they are high quality information. They're supplemented by useful tools, practices and behavior change strategies. It's important to note that Naturally, our uh, content and recommendations are general in nature. They cannot and do not address specific individual uh, requirements that may apply. Uh, our content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. And of course, please, 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 uh, if, with any kinds of questions or concerns, please seek the advice of medical professionals. So, uh what we're going to work on today is understanding the impact of vicarious trauma or VT. I will refer to it as vicarious trauma or VT. Uh, we'll have a look at signs and symptoms. We'll have a look at different styles of coping and ways then that we can support ourselves, ways that we can support staff uh, from an organizational perspective. So, We'll break it down first things first, and we'll have a look at various uh, definitions and explanations of uh, vicarious trauma and all parts of it. So trauma itself is a disturbing experience that can result in uh, various ways of it manifesting for us. So fear, helplessness, dissociation, confusion, anything that, that disrupts our emotional well-being, anything that disrupts our quality of life. And it has a long lasting negative effect on how we move in the world. And when we think of uh, the definition of vicarious, so that's something that is experienced in place of uh, another person. So it is an experience that's acting or serving as 
a substitute and something whereby we feel an imagined participation in the experience of others. So if you've ever heard of the phrase, I'm living vicariously through you, I would say it to uh, people in my life that have a better social <laughs> life than me. You know, and it is a common phrase. It is something that we hear a lot to be at living vicariously through somebody else. So if we take this information that's familiar to us and we apply it within a professional setting and we apply it within our own lived experience when it comes to our workplace, we can tend to uh, retain a lot of the, the meaning that we learn. So to look at a, a phrase like that, living vicariously through somebody else, it means that we are having the same or similar experience as them, even though we are living a different life, even though we are holding our own individual separate experiences. So if we take that information that we're getting from that, the definition of vicarious, and we couple it with what we uh, know and what we are learning about the definition of trauma, it is something that we experience on behalf of somebody else. So it is a process of change or an experience or impact of trauma that we can hold, that we can internalize, that we can contain because of something that we are seeing, something that we are hearing, something that we are witness to in some shape or form, but it's not directly happening to us. Uh, it's something that can come about when we are looking at graphic content, when we are seeing people in uh, situations that will feel disturbing, if we are seeing people in distress or if there's any kind of pain or uh, violence and we have a sense of commitment or a sense of responsibility to help them. So this is something that can come about when we are uh, indirectly experiencing this repeatedly, okay? So we are indirectly experiencing something again and again and again and again. And it can happen if we are having this repeated experience and we're not looking after ourselves. So we're not putting in place um, those safeguarding processes. Uh, we'll discuss them in more detail later on. But that idea of uh, looking after ourselves, recognizing signs and symptoms, self-care, gaining and getting support from those uh, around us. So if we are exposed to something that's very disturbing, very distressing, and we are, are exposed to it um, uh, over an extensive period of time, and we're not addressing the situation or the situation is not being addressed, that can potentially lead to an experience of vicarious trauma. So it can lead to changes in our own lives. I'd mentioned about the change uh, in our emotional well-being and our quality of life when it comes to trauma in general. So that vicarious trauma can show up in lots of different ways. So it, we might uh, sense or experience a change with our uh, well-being in a holistic sense. So, for example, we might have uh, very affected or changed uh, opinions or views of the world, of the people around us, of ourselves. Uh, our values and, uh, and beliefs might be uh, shaken or there might be a destructive nature to that and our feelings of safety. It all comes back to that need for safety and our, our, our human drive for safety and anything that affects that in a negative way, anything that impacts that in a negative way. It has that knock on effect to our emotional well-being and like I say, that quality of life as well. So. When we're talking about vicarious trauma, really important for us to uh, look at empathy and not only the role of empathy, <clears throat> let's say, in our lives, but in a, a workplace setting as well. So if we're thinking about the definition of empathy, it's our ability to identify with somebody else's experience, to understand what's going on for them with regard to their their joy, their pain, other parts of the experience. And another well-known phrase around empathy would be putting myself in someone else's shoes. So relating to somebody's experience 
through our ability to tap into our empathy. Now, to be empathetic is a wonderful quality. It's important for us to have empathy and to grow empathy as well, because, you know, not only is there that that human drive for safety that's part of our emotional well-being but our ability to connect as well so the idea of acceptance belonging connecting uh, community all of these things are are innate in us as humans as well so you know for us to be able to engage in the work of content moderation you know at the back of it at the core of it there is that purpose and that meaning of it in order to make a difference, in order to be able to uh, gain control of something positive and to be able to consistently uh, put that good out into the world, you know. So empathy is a huge part of that. And at the same time, empathy has a huge part of vicarious trauma as well, because if we are empathizing with somebody that we are seeing or we're witnessing in a distressing experience, that can have a knock-on effect to us. It's not that we need to change who we are. It's just that we need to be aware of all of these different parts of the experience and to, uh, to link it in with uh, managing our situation, managing our, our, our experience and being kind to ourself within that as well. Okay, so if uh, you have had an experience of vicarious trauma, if you uh, are looking at who you are within your role, whether that's the, the work, the responsibilities that you have, or whether it's your place within the collective of the, the the organization that you're working for. You know, there can be different things that we are uh, telling ourselves. Our inner critic can get very loud as well. So it's good for us to kind of deconstruct these myths or to spell them uh, for ourselves, to get realistic. But by being realistic, we're being more um, fair uh, and compassionate with ourselves. So perhaps we might tell ourselves, OK, well, all I need to do is just to work harder and then I won't experience vicarious trauma or maybe I need to hold better uh, boundaries. Maybe I need to compartmentalize. Maybe I can separate uh, my working life from my personal life and I feel as if I shouldn't get involved or uh, I, sh I, I don't get involved. Maybe we are telling ourselves, OK, well, it just won't happen to me. Or maybe we are holding ourselves up to an unrealistic standard by saying, well, if I'm professional enough, I won't experience it. You know, if we look at something, especially that last uh, statement there, we're looking at something like that and we are holding that expectation for ourselves that if I am professional, I won't experience it. So what happens then? If we do experience it, we go into that territory then of maybe telling ourselves that we're not professional. Maybe we might start telling ourselves that we're not good enough, that we are not able to do the work that we have intended to do. The reality of the situation is that we're human, you know, so really, really important for us to be mindful of that, to allow ourselves to be human. And it sounds very simple. It sounds maybe silly the way that I'm saying it, but it is something that we need to return to at all times, that we're human and that we will sometimes have human responses to things. OK, so different things that we look for then with regard to risk factors around vicarious trauma would be what is our current context. And that can encompass a lot of different things. So different stressors that we're holding now, whether it is um, things that are happening in our personal life, maybe there are different things that are coming up for us by way of stressful experiences overall. We need to factor in everything when it comes to uh, looking at our own situation right now. It's like taking a snapshot of everything that is uh, happening for us right now. We can't leave anything out. All the different parts of my experience have a part to play in 
how I uh, react to things and how I am impacted by things. Uh, to look at our coping strategies. Now, we don't need to be judgmental with these. We don't need to give ourselves a hard time for, let's say, having different uh, coping strategies that may have worked at some point, but may not work for ourselves right now or might be kind of unhealthy for us. Looking at our personal history. So looking at what our story is, where we are coming from, what our uh, lived experiences have been up to date. You know what I mean? My story is going to be different from the next person and the next person because I have lived a unique individual life. So I will have experienced things that are uh, individual to me, but I'll carry these things. So we can't leave any of that stuff out. Different uh, risk factors as well could be social support or a lack of social support or, you know, engaging in social support that might be uh, unhealthy for us. And of course, it's going to be down to uh, what our role is. What kind of responsibilities do we have? What does our day look like? So what kind uh, of content are we exposed to? What's the duration of it? You know, and, and linking all of these pieces together, they're all parts of a bigger puzzle. So it's important for us to to observe this stuff, to be curious about it, but not to jump to conclusions within it either. So not to, to get stuck or get caught in one part and, and start to give ourselves a hard time over it. You know, we're looking at this as information that we're going to take forward in order to look after ourselves and in order to maintain that routine of looking after ourselves as well. So I'd mentioned coping mechanisms there. Again, nothing that we need to be uh, judgmental towards ourselves around. We're looking at what's there. We're looking at that snapshot and we're seeing, well, what's working and what's not. So perhaps we may be at a low point with regard to our resilience that can be as a, uh, a result of lots of different things. Maybe we've gone through a particularly tough challenge in our own lives. Maybe we have been uh, working very hard without taking breaks or seeking that support. Maybe we don't um, have a support network or support system, uh, depending on, like I'd mentioned there, depending on the type of content, depending on how that fits with our lived experience, what our own triggers are and the duration of it, of course. Uh, perhaps we are in a habit of ignoring our emotions or suppressing our emotions. Maybe overall our mental health isn't uh, as good as it could be. Maybe we don't necessarily feel very buoyant in that sense. And maybe we find it difficult uh, to hold boundaries within the, this, the workplace setting, but also switching off and having that work-life balance as well. Again, we don't need to beat ourselves up over anything that shows up as a, a risk or an unhealthy coping mechanism, we're using this information. So it's it's good for us to have this. It'll signpost us to where we need to go and what kind of support we need as well. OK, so to look at the experience of vicarious trauma, we need to look at things from a, a holistic perspective. So we want to be looking at the connection of thoughts, emotions and our behavior as well. So when we experience vicarious trauma, it will affect us in all those different ways. So it'll affect how we think, it'll affect how we feel and it'll affect how we act as well. So different kinds of uh, thoughts that we can hold or or perhaps cycle of thoughts, different emotions uh, that can come about for us and ways in which we see ourselves behaving or acting in the world. Different signs with regard to those things could be when we're talking about behavior. So it might affect our sleeping. It might affect our concentration or uh, exhaustion. Other uh, behavioral uh, signs would be there as well. So different kind of thoughts, 
that can come about for us or different thought processes that can come about for us would be intrusive thoughts, unrealistic expectations, a negative uh, world view or negative thoughts in general, different emotional experiences that we can have within that uh, greater experience of vicarious trauma would be having uh, a difficulty managing those uh, emotions, feeling as if they're they're. Uh, there's a helplessness to it. So there's a lack of control or perhaps a lack of understanding uh, with regard to the emotions that are coming up for us. We might have a guilt about ha- finding joy in the world because of what we are witnessing and the indirect uh, effect of that. We might be feeling those deep, intense emotions like grief, anxiety, sadness, uh, anger. So lots of different things that can come about Uh, within the experience of vicarious trauma. Now, this is extensive and it's important that it's extensive so that we have that, um, that we're mindful of the experience. It's not for us to... Uh, you know, I'm not trying to worry anybody by being uh, uh, very thorough with this. The more we know, the more we are able to identify a change in our uh, experience and uh, the more that we will be able to seek that support. So good for us to be able to recognize all of those different links. So being triggered by something, holding that emotional, cognitive and behavioral uh, experience, noticing change in who we are, how we relate to ourselves, what our experience is and how we relate to the world as well. So perhaps, you know, we might be having thoughts like I can't cope. I haven't done enough. You know, I'm thinking different things about the world. Uh, maybe the uh, emotional experience is that we're very frightened. Maybe we feel very low. Maybe there's a, a feeling of numbness as well. Maybe physically we can have those nightmares or or flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, racing heart, all that kind of stuff. And behavior then, we might feel as if we are hypervigilant all the time, or we might feel like we are avoiding certain things that we wouldn't have done before. Or, you know, we might feel as if we've reached a point uh, that's known as compassion fatigue, where we just don't have anything left in the tank with regard to um, engaging or having that meaning or having uh, that purpose or that, that you know, that that empathy with that. That's another aspect of it as well. So to really to be mindful of something that feels different, something that feels very uncomfortable and something that is relentless for us and is having that um, having that uh, extensive impact on our life and on our world. So if we are thinking about uh, starting a conversation around vicarious trauma. It is something, you know, from an organizational point of view, it is something that it is so important to talk about, but it's also, uh, you know, from a managerial perspective, let's say, if we are in the role of support and encouragement and guidance, it's important for us to be able to have that knowledge. And it's also important for us to be able to engage in a consistent open uh, conversations with our our colleagues and our team as well. So there are different ways that we can address it in a setting, whether that's in a group setting or a one-to-one setting, to focus on the purpose of the work. This is something that can help to bring that perspective and help to remind us of the meaning as well. So to ask a question, why do you do this work? How do you measure success in this work? as well and finding ways to come back to why we do what we do to find that perspective and find that outlook that would have drawn us uh, to this work in the first place and that provided that fulfillment as well to have conversations around uh, how we structure the day or you know how we move through the day to day. So it's good to look at the, the finer details in that sense as well. So if there is a possibility to change things within uh, your control, you know, uh, let's say you are a manager stepping up and having this conversation, you know, to empower somebody to uh, make changes that they can. And uh, when there is some uh, uh, changes that can be made 
from the, at the manager's level to be able to do that for the greater good for the person's mental health, for the person's quality of life and, you know, the, for the humanity uh, of it all. Um, to be able to encourage uh, taking breaks and to be mindful of um, breaks that are being taken or not taking as the case or not being taken as the case may be. Um, having pause points throughout the day. So this isn't necessarily a break, but it's a, an opportunity for us to center ourselves, to be able to step back and to kind of reground uh, ourselves. We regularly need that, uh, especially when there is an intensity to the day or if we are feeling that very intense emotional um, impact of the day. Uh, to look at healthy habits that are available to us throughout our day and not to rely on just one because, it, it, you know, it, it tends to happen whereby if we have one thing that we use throughout our working day that helps us or that's useful for us, that may change. So that might work well for us right now, but we might, we might reach a point where it's, it's not working or it's not doing the same thing that it used to. So the more that we can open those options of those habits that we build up, the better it'll be for us. So how we, um, how we feel about our work as well. So starting a conversation around this or even to have a reflection point around any of these points. How do you feel about your work? How do how does it sit with you emotionally? How does it leave you feeling? And what are those different kinds of emotions that come up for you throughout the day? Um, do you feel like you have balance? Is there a sense of being able to switch off? This is a very simplistic question, but it's important to ask these simple questions. Do you feel stressed? Do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel as if there is something brewing or something growing within the, your own lived experience? And are there any habits that uh, the purpose of them is for well-being, but perhaps they're not working so well uh, anymore? Is there change that's needed within uh, those habits. So, uh, you know, to, to bring it back then to starting an actual conversation around uh, vicarious trauma or to start a conversation around uh, engaging with somebody who has been affected, who is experiencing vicarious trauma. If we are stepping in from an organizational perspective, you know, to, uh, first things first, that sense of community and that sense of collaboration are vital within uh, within a setting where there is so much intensity, where there is so much potential negative impact, where there is uh, so much that's needed with regard to uh, focus and uh, to be precise with work. So we need to be um, we need to be modeling and to be. Um, encouraging psychological safety. So that would include uh, be as a manager, being approachable, having a culture of uh, open spaces, feeling safe to talk, you know, being able to uh, normalize conversations around these topics like vicarious trauma. And, you know, to be able to maintain a culture like this, it does take a lot of work from the top down. So it does need to be walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Uh, but in a specific situation, if we are uh, looking out for somebody, if we're in that role of support in any kind of a way, whether it's as a manager, whether it's uh, with regard to a peer or a colleague, to start a conversation is something that we build. OK, so to be able to look at the do's and don'ts of uh, starting a conversation. So assessing what's needed within the setting. So assessing what those concerns are that are coming up, listening to uh, the person that's in front of you without pressuring them to talk and to be able to provide a safe space, a comfortable space, a calm space is vital. We do the best in the situation that we find ourselves to be able to engage in uh, empowerment by way of a referral to uh, further information and resources as well. What we don't want to do is to push anyone 
or pressure anybody uh, <clears throat> to move through a, a detailed experience of what they've had. They may not understand it. They may not have the words. If they are overwhelmed, they might not have access to rational thought in that moment. We're not putting pressure on anybody to come to a decision as to what happened and why it happened or to uh, to speak uh, more than what they are comfortable with. Also, you know, it can be an extreme or an exceptional circumstance that somebody might be at risk uh, in these situations, even though they are exceptional, even though they are extreme, it's important that we are well aware and it's important that we are uh, engaged in that, that process of learning what to do in those uh, settings. So to be able to provide discretion rather than saying uh, everything is confidential, there may be a need to seek further support in the moment. And, you know, if we're offering confidentiality within that, uh, that might not be available to us. OK, so overall, when we think about support, I really want you to think about this by way of being proactive about uh in putting in place a routine or putting in place a structure, looking at it as another task that's part of our role or that's part of our responsibilities throughout the day. So different supports that we can engage in ourselves or we can encourage others uh, to engage in. And when I say encourage, I mean providing that information and giving them the agency to engage in what is a good fit for them. We're not trying to march people into rooms to engage in uh, well-being that would defeat the purpose of it. But, you know, if there are, uh, uh, let's say, well-being specialists with, uh, at Zevo Health, we would provide that support. So I would be a well-being specialist. So I would provide uh, support for those people who are engaged in the work of content moderation and, you know, at times can feel affected or feel overwhelmed by it. So that can be in a one to one setting, that can be in a group setting, depending on what the, the support service looks like. You know, it, it's also important if it's if it feels like a good fit to engage in counselling uh, and therapy that's external uh, to the workplace, because we're not just uh, our work selves. It's important for us to look at our health as a whole. It's important to look at uh, our needs as a whole, the full context, social support. So providing ourselves with authentic social connection, maybe distraction, maybe that expression, all these different things, these wonderful things that come to us through connection and through community as well. Being able to engage in work-life balance as well, that will look different from person to person. So what feels right for you, giving yourself permission uh, at the start of it, communication is huge. So if you are a content moderator and you're engaging in this work and you're being affected in this way and you're concerned to be able to speak up about it, to be able to speak to a manager or a colleague or something like that, we don't need to ignore it. In fact, it's better that we don't. It's better that we're transparent with ourselves and others and our own form of self-care as well. So having self-care routines throughout the day, but also having self-care um, rituals and structures that would go beyond the workplace as well. So just a couple of examples of ways that we can ground ourselves in the moment when we are, uh, let's say, in the process of uh, being affected or we're feeling overwhelmed. This is an ST. OP grounding technique. Who doesn't love a good acronym? I certainly do anyway, but this is something that can bring us back to the present moment. So S-T-O-P, you stop what you're doing, first of all, and you take some deep breaths, slow down that breath, observe how your body feels and proceed with something that will soothe you. So maybe it's taking a step away, maybe it's going outside, maybe it's engaging with a colleague, something like that where we can bring ourselves to the here and now. Uh, another technique would be to uh, engage in progressive muscle relaxation. When we are overwhelmed, we're feeling all of those different signs and symptoms. Our body can be very tense and it can build that tension over time. So PMR or progressive muscle relaxation is something where we engage in that tension. So we take different parts of the body like the jaw, shoulders, hands, feet, uh, whatever it is that you prefer 
and we tighten it. We hold it for 10 seconds and then we release it. So it's not that we're trying to just relax. I mean, whoever in the history of time has relaxed by (laughs) being told to relax. We engage, we acknowledge it. So we're actually uh, being proactive around it. So an example could be, let's say, to engage in progressive muscle relaxation with your hand or your fist. So if we were doing a full practice, I would tell you to clench your fist, hold it really, really tight, as tight as you can, and hold for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and release. Release it, go, feel the softness, feel the tingle, feel the nothing if there's nothing there. And so we we take it step by step with different parts uh, of the body. Overall, then looking forward, we mentioned about self-care, looking after ourselves, looking uh, looking at it as a proactive um, benefit to our lives, things that are nurturing, things that will help us by way of community or social support, rest, finding balance, letting that balance change as well. And also from the perspective of purpose and meaning as well, to be able to come back to why we chose to do this in the first place and to look at it from the perspective of giving back by doing something, taking control and by providing. Okay, so key takeaways then would be to uh, to acknowledge what's happening for you. If you are having the signs and symptoms of vicarious trauma or if you see it in somebody that you uh, are managing or that you are supporting, to recognize uh, the impact, to look at it, not to ignore it, but just to step up and say, okay, this is something that is possible. It's something that's human. I will be better off by engaging in the reality of the situation rather than pretending that it's not happening or being hard on ourselves. To develop different tools for ourselves to regulate. So to to identify that there's that connection between our thoughts, our emotions, our behavior and different things that we can build. So we build our practice, we build our familiarity around Uh, these kinds of techniques. We just looked at a couple there uh, to recognize that if we are affected by this in a very extreme or intense way, give yourself time to recover. Okay, so we're thinking about recovery in the moment and we're thinking about recovery over time as well and resource yourselves. So uh, like this could be seeking out the support of uh, as Evo Health Wellbeing Specialist or to engage in the services that are provided or it's to see what I'm capable of. Where is my resilience at? You know, what support do I have with regard to my colleagues and my organizational structure as well? There's lots of things that you can do to look after yourself. It's better for us to be aware of the potentials. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen. It just means that we are informed and we're mindful of what we can do. So if you are experiencing symptoms of vicarious trauma, please do reach out to a professional for support and to be able to engage in that support network that is around you. Don't feel like you have to do it on your own. These things are in place for a reason and let yourself be helped. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you so much for uh, stopping by. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully there was something of use uh, in there for you. Uh, If you would like to uh, find out further information about vicarious trauma or the the services that are provided by Zevo Health, all the details are there. Please uh, get in touch. We'd be delighted to help out. 